Winter Storms, one of the more simple types of storm systems that occur across the world, at least in context to meteorology. More often than not, the majority of them are nothing to write home about in the weather history books. Very rarely do winter storms cause billions of dollars in damages, and rarely do fatalities end up being over 50 in the United States. But there are exceptions. There's a few significant winter storm events that are remembered to this day, two of them specifically on a national level. One of those is the 1993 storm of the century, and the other one, the topic of today's video, is the costliest natural disaster observed in the United States. A series of winter storms alongside one of the coldest arctic blasts in the United States in recent memory spelled disaster for the state of Texas. That event was the 2021 Texas Deep Freeze, also known as the 2021 Valentine's Week Winter Outbreak. In February 2021, a blast of arctic air swept across the United States, bringing with them two winter storms which swept across the eastern and central portions of the United States. Most of the states affected saw significant impacts, but nothing outright historic in terms of winter precipitation. Except for the Lone Star State. Record snowfall and ice alongside the bitter Arctic air left the state of Texas virtually frozen over. For nearly a week, snow and ice encompassed the vast majority of Texas. Pipes burst due to the extreme cold, and the Texas power grid failed across the majority of the state due to a series of failures made by those in control. The official estimate from the state of Texas alone places the damage total from the 2021 Texas Deep Freeze at at least $195 billion in damages, while newer estimates suggest that the damage total could be as high as $300 billion in damages in the state. But what exactly led to this horrific series of events to happen in the first place? Well, that's what I'm here to do today. Today, I will be taking a deep dive into the 2021 Texas Deep Freeze, giving a brief overview on how winter weather setups work, the synopsis of the event, the preparations taken, an overview of what happened meteorologically and on the ground, the response, the aftermath, and the significance of the event. Welcome to Nature's Fury. Winter weather is often a general term that combines a bunch of different weather systems into one big group, all connected because it requires the air itself to be cold. There are winter storms, a storm system that contains a combination of heavy snow, blowing snow, and or dangerous wind chills. In terms of winter precipitation, there's snow, sleet, and freezing rain. What type of precipitation occurs is related to the temperatures in a series of layers in the air that can cause the precipitation to melt or freeze on the way down to the ground. There are blizzards, winter storms, but with high winds, which can bring whiteout conditions, ice storms, which produce at least a quarter of an inch of ice onto exposed surfaces, and then there are arctic blasts which is the general term given to massive temperature drops behind an arctic front. So what do you need for winter precipitation? Moisture, lift, and of course, cold air. Now, the issue of cold air isn't an issue further north, but for our topic today of Texas, that tends to be problematic. Winter storms are rare in the southern and southeastern United States because freezing temperatures do not last or when it does get below freezing, it's right behind a cold front. And considering that most cold fronts have warm fronts attached to them, it's easy to see as to why the south doesn't get winter weather that much. But it doesn't mean that it can't happen. The best bet for winter weather is a low pressure system's northern half. In winter storms, this is where the most snowfall typically occurs. There's enough moisture there due to the dry line setup being further south, there isn't a warm front, and there's enough lift for winter precipitation. Again, in the south, it's often rare for these temperatures to be cold enough for winter weather, but it's not impossible. What makes winter weather dangerous is the effects on basic infrastructure. Ice specifically is the biggest culprit in this regard. Ice on the road leads to less traction between car tires and the roads, leading to car accidents and pileups. The colder temperatures, especially after the precipitation has stopped falling, can cause hypothermia and a variety of other health issues without any source of heating. The ice, alongside strong winds, tends to knock out power, which is a major issue because then people who are unprepared do not have access to common ways of heating themselves. It's rare for winter weather to get that bad to where multiple states have millions upon millions of people without power, but as we will get into shortly, the 2021 Texas Deep Freeze was one event where that occurred. But real quick, before I jump into synopsis, the majority of people who like these videos are not subscribed to the channel, so if you enjoy what I create, consider subscribing. It helps the channel and tells me I'm doing something right. Anyways, back to the 2021 Texas Deep Freeze. The 2021 Texas Deep Freeze is an event that actually encompasses a major Arctic freeze that lasted from February 10th all the way through the 20th, 
and two different winter storms over the course of a week. The major contributor towards the winter weather that occurred was the unusually bitter Arctic air in the United States. From February 9th through the 10th, a strong winter storm brought significant impacts to the Ohio River and Mississippi River valleys, but the winter storm's impacts to Texas were minimal. What was important was that the winter storm's cold front brought cold temperatures into portions of Texas. On February 11th, North Texas would get their first taste of the series of the two winter storms to come, as lingering moisture across Texas led to spotty showers of freezing rain across the Dallas-Fort Worth metro, icing the roads. Of course, the primary concern for meteorologists was what was going to happen a few days later. At the same time, a well-defined low and frontal system was located off the coast of the Pacific Northwest on February 11th, and moved to the southeast due to steering from a shortwave trough over the next few days, bringing cold air, snow, and ice with it, with the primary effects of the system being observed in Texas from February 14th through the 15th. Temperatures were already below freezing across the majority of Texas, even before the winter storm moved in. As the storm moved in, temperatures plummeted, dropping drastically into the negatives across most of Texas and across the majority of the country. Then, another winter storm developed off the coast of Texas on the 16th, bringing even more snow and ice to the state. This winter storm would then move across the southern United States before splitting into two, with the northern half moving towards Quebec, with the other system moving off the coast of New England. Snow, sleet, and freezing rain were on the table when it came to both winter storms in Texas, with the first winter storm primarily producing massive amounts of snow across the state, with the second winter storm primarily bringing ice, and lots of it. NWS offices were expecting a historic week regarding winter weather across the state of Texas, and broadcast meteorologists were not mincing their words. On the local level, as early as February 10th, electric utility crews were put on standby as the National Weather Service began issuing detailed statements on the upcoming event. But the residents, nor the rest of the country, didn't pay as much attention as they probably should have. Locals in Texas did prepare by stocking up on some supplies, but even with the messaging in place, a lot of Texans seemed unprepared. And what I don't remember anything very much about the before, except for it was cold. I mean, it was a colder than normal for us. I mean, for us, we are used to weather that's probably maybe in the 50s or 60s or 40s. So anything below 45, we're like, okay, this is weird, right? And like, and we will make sure to go ahead and like always prepare ahead of time, right? We, um, basically how we prepare is we make sure we have enough canned food that we can cook over the fire. I mean, because we have a gas fire in my house. And I know you're not supposed to cook over a gas fireplace, but when worse comes to worse, you do what you do. You need to do, right? And we didn't know if we are going to lose power or not. Thankfully, we didn't. Nobody I know did. But we didn't know in ahead of time, right? And so, and one thing I remember we preparing was making sure we had enough firewood, making sure we had enough, like, water, like, you know, water bottles, and we had enough basic foods, you know? None. We were pretty much blindsided, honestly. We we, uh, we made the worst decision. I, I made the worst decision to kind of downplay it, honestly, because I didn't think it was going to, like, we're, we were going to see something on scale of, like, what you would usually see somewhere around like the central united states let's say maybe kansas or maybe even arkansas or northern arkansas but oof that we we did what we could luckily it um didn't do as bad but we struggled Speculating the situation before it happened, it was likely that those across Texas felt like, one, the snow, sleet, and ice accumulations were not going to be as significant as they ended up being, two, preparations that needed to be made by local residents and governments were not seen as necessary as they might have needed to be given the expected severity of the event, and most importantly, three, the power grid would not fail in a catastrophic way. The power grid and the state of it needs to be explained before going any further into the timeline of events that occurred in Texas. The Texas power grid is weird. I say weird because it works nothing like any other power grid in the United States. But first, we gotta go back in time. To the 1800s, I swear this is relevant. When electricity was new and power grids began their early development, Texas kept to themselves and made their own power grids, with companies interconnecting their own power grids in Texas to create the Texas Interconnected System. As part of the New Deal that President Franklin Delano Roosevelt made, FDR signed the Federal Power Act, 
which charged the Federal Power Commission with overseeing interstate electricity sales. So if Texas's power grid overlapped with other states, they'd be subject to regulations by the federal government. Texas could sustain itself due to an abundance of resources, so it wasn't seen as a major problem at the time. So Texas, being Texas, lived another day by not being subject to federal regulations. But in 1970, after a major blackout in the northeastern United States, the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, or ERCOT, was formed, covering most of the state of Texas. Now, ERCOT is not in charge of all of the Texas power grid. There's portions of the state, more specifically parts of the Panhandle and portions of Far Eastern Texas, that are not under ERCOT's control. The ERCOT grid, by only being in Texas, is not subject to federal government inspection, regulation, or funding. ERCOT is not monitored or managed by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Over the 1990s, the Texas electricity market was deregulated, aiming at counteracting the shortage of generation capacity at the time. Okay, so why is this a problem? Texas hates the feds so much that it's practically their entire state motto, what else is new? Well, remember back when I covered Katrina that the levee system's biggest issues came down to getting away with shortcuts because there wasn't any specific oversight agency that checked on whether or not the levee system was actually worth anything? Yeah, it's that all over again. ERCOT, as it stands, is held by a board of directors that is subject to oversight by the Public Utility Commission of Texas and the Texas State Legislature. The PUC has jurisdiction over what ERCOT does, and members of the PUC are appointed by the Governor of Texas. TLDR, bureaucracy ensues. Because ERCOT and the PUC are not subject to federal regulation, they can selectively choose what standards they want to include for the power grid's infrastructure. But it also means they can just flat out ignore any suggestions made by other agencies. What happened during the Texas Deep Freeze came down to a lack of resources, and that ERCOT refused to upgrade their infrastructure for winter weather, a policy and process referred to as winterization. The first issue was resources. Now it goes without saying that electricity requires fuel in order to work, whether that be through non-renewable energy sources such as fossil fuels or natural gas, or through renewable energy sources such as wind, solar, or hydroelectric, or nuclear because that is in its own category. Now production of these sources of energy are managed by a few different agencies altogether, the important source of fuel for this event is natural gas, which is regulated by the Texas Railroad Commission. Goes without saying that when temperatures plummet well below freezing, that production of resources such as petroleum and natural gas go down, and the operations of wind farms go down as well. In order to get ahead of that, with an expected increase in demand for electricity if it were to get cold, there would need to be a lot of resources in reserve. But there wasn't a lot. A lot of the grid relies on there being a constant production of resources to avoid the grid crashing. With very little resources in reserve, it was only a matter of time before the issue would come back to haunt them. But the biggest problem was the issues regarding winterization. ERCOT did not winterize their power grid's infrastructure after being suggested to do so. How are they able to do this? Because they aren't subject to federal regulations. The reason as to why they are against winterization is because, well, Texas doesn't experience winter weather often and it doesn't really affect areas that far south. Which, while true to an extent, really doesn't mean that the state is immune from winter weather. The Deep South isn't immune from winter storms. They get winter storms once every few years, with some areas getting a large amount of snow such as in 2011, 2014, and in 2021. 2011 specifically was the year that Texas remembers when it comes to winter weather as Texas was hit hard by the 2011 Groundhog Day blizzard, and the state suffered rolling blackouts with 75% of the state being affected by them. And it got so bad that Mexico was sending power to Texas through the Sherry Land Utilities interconnection. Texas was told to winterize their power grid to prevent what happened in 2011 from happening again. That suggestion was ignored, because if there's anything that Texas, or for a matter of fact, any state likes to do, it's ignoring improving basic infrastructure because it costs money. Not to mention that in November of 2020, regulations that helped to punish companies that failed to deliver electricity during the 2011 blizzard were cut entirely. And when the power fails, a lot of other issues begin to arise. So the issues with the power grid were addressed multiple times without anything being done. And with it being up to the state, it was only a matter of time before something happened where the state of Texas would see a winter weather crisis like no other. And that happened in 2021. February 10th. 
While the main winter storm systems did not come into Texas until the 14th, the Arctic air from the Central Plains began to seep down southward into North Central Texas. This would be responsible for the cold air that was in place across most of Texas. However, there was enough moisture in the air to support sleet and freezing rain, not as an organized line, but as sporadic showers of freezing rain over the nighttime hours on February 10th into the early morning hours of the 11th. With this risk in mind, the National Weather Service began issuing winter weather advisories for the possibilities of ice on the roads. One of the common sayings regarding winter weather is that if there is any winter precipitation coming, it's to stay off the roads. Or if you are on the roads, it's to go slower than the speed limit. Why is this important? Because Texas soon saw the first big sign of what was to come in the early morning hours of the 11th. February 11th, the Fort Worth pileup. As ice began to accumulate on the roadways, more specifically on the bridges where ice began to accumulate first, drivers were spinning out and crashing into one another. The issue with bridges specifically is because bridges ice more easily than roads do. Why? Simple. Being surrounded on all sides by cold air means that there's less insulation when compared to having solid ground underfoot. So there are instances where the road itself isn't iced, but the bridge is. The issue of bridges icing first led to one of the worst pileups in recent memory. Car after car, truck after truck, semi after semi, not being able to see the black ice that had formed onto the bridges or aware of the risk of black ice, began ramming into each other, creating one of the largest pileups in Texas state history. Over 100 vehicles were involved in the pileup, with six people ultimately losing their lives. The pileup was already a sign of things to come with the dangerous winter weather ahead. How dangerous driving becomes even with the smallest amount of ice. But the issues regarding the potential failure of the power grid were already being observed. Due to the freezing temperatures in the state, water and oil and gas wells, where methane gas is extracted to use as energy for power plants, led to gas production to plummet before anyone lost power. By the end of the deep freeze, gas production in Texas dropped by 45%. February 12th. On February 12th, Governor Greg Abbott issued a state of emergency for the entire state of Texas, for all 254 counties. The Texas Division of Emergency Management began to deploy multiple state agencies to support response operations. The Railroad Commission, in charge of regulating the state's oil and gas, orders gas deliveries to be prioritized for homes, which is great for the 40% of Texan homes that are heated with gas, but not for those whose homes are heated through electricity. Winter storm watches began being issued by the National Weather Service across the state of Texas, and would continue to be issued over the next day across Texas and across other areas in the country in the path of the winter storm. February 13th By February 13th, the cold weather disrupted a total of 22 gas processing plants. By the end of the deep freeze, 38 gas plants shut down or reduced production, equivalent to 8.9 billion cubic feet of lost gas processing plant capacity per day. Already, gas power plants are unable to supply the demand. The supply of fuel needed for Texans to use electricity is already becoming problematic, as equipment at power plants begin to freeze. Other sources of energy, such as coal and nuclear power plants, go offline, as valves and other equipment freezes, and dozens of wind turbines stop as ice begins forming around the blades. As gas plants have no place to send gas, wells producing gas were vented or set aflame, with a total of 1.6 billion cubic feet of methane, instead of it being used for power because of the frigid temperatures, was disposed of. And all of the events that I just mentioned happened before the major winter storm began to produce snow over Texas. Winter storm warnings began being issued across Texas and the country, and very few would know the true horrors that would be experienced by those in its path, but it would be worse than anyone could have expected it to be. February 14th the first winter storm. As the early morning hours came, every single square inch of the state of Texas was under a winter storm warning. The state and a sea of pink. NWS offices across the state expecting near blizzard-like conditions, specifically near Dallas, although it would be a while before winter precipitation would truly begin accumulating. Multiple states in the path of the winter storm, from Oklahoma to Ohio and Illinois, would be seeing significant precipitation totals. But the big focus was on Texas. Throughout the early morning hours, snowfall was beginning to pile up across Oklahoma, the Texas Panhandle, and New Mexico as the low-pressure system was riding the jet stream. 
By noon, a complete line of snow showers extended from Oklahoma through San Angelo, Texas, moving through the state throughout the day and into the next. The timing saw the worst of the snow and ice come into areas such as Houston and the Dallas-Fort Worth area to be during the early morning hours of the 15th and into the afternoon hours. But as the Arctic front moved through, the threat now became the deadly cold. Wind chill warnings and advisories began to be issued as the cold front swept across the country. With wind chills expected to be around negative 50 to negative 35 degrees Fahrenheit across the northern parts of the country, and from negative 10 to negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit across the central portions of the country. In Texas, wind chills were expected to peak during the afternoon hours on the 14th throughout most of the week, with wind chills ranging from the negative 20s in the northern part of the state through the single digits near the coastline. Records would be broken as the temperatures continued to drop. Pipes began to burst, an issue which would continue to plague Texas and other states throughout the week. But the power crisis was just beginning. As people began turning up their heaters, demand for gas and electricity surged, and ERCOT projected that electricity demand will exceed the supply, and issues an urgent alert asking for consumers to conserve electricity because you can easily conserve electricity when you are trying to prevent being submerged with wind chills below zero degrees. In the late night hours of the 14th and the early morning hours of the 15th, ERCOT set an all-time winter peak record for the system load of 69,871 megawatts. ERCOT warns the possibility of rolling blackouts throughout the week, in an effort to conserve resources. During this, President Joe Biden signed a disaster declaration for the state of Texas allowing for federal aid to be allocated to the state. The Texas power grid was obviously already faltering, but it still had a long way to go before it would hit rock bottom. February 15th As snow, sleet, and freezing rain pummeled the state of Texas throughout the 14th and into the 15th, the power grid was struggling. The state of the power grid in ERCOT's territory specifically was only continuing to get worse, as inches of snow fell across Texas followed by strong winds and bitter cold temperatures. It was only a matter of time before things spiraled out of control. And spiral it did. At 1 a.m., ERCOT orders electric companies across the state to cut power to homes and businesses to help prevent a complete shutdown of the entire power grid, a process called load shedding. Areas designated as critical infrastructure, places such as hospitals, are left alone while neighborhoods have their power cut off, left with no ways of heating without generators, or using other means of keeping warm such as gas stoves and grills, and using their cars if they could. The use of gas stoves, generators, grills, and vehicles led to people dying of carbon monoxide poisoning, all in an effort to stay warm and to prevent hypothermia and frostbite. By Monday evening, 3.6 million homes and businesses are without power, and most of the state is under a blackout. Methane gas processing facilities which were not registered as critical infrastructure, lose power, further increasing the difficulty in providing the gas to power plants. Oil refineries, chemical plants, and other industrial operators lose power, with 3.5 million pounds of pollution being released. And yet again, it somehow gets worse. A computer glitch occurred during the day where megawatts were taken off of the power grid due to incorrect price signals. So, what does the PUC do in order to help fix the problem? Well, the PUC orders ERCOT to correct that problem manually. By setting the prices to $9,000 per megawatt hour to encourage more supply to come online. An order that turns out lasted for two days longer than it was supposed to. That doesn't work at all. And what ends up happening is that the Texas utility company Gritty looks at the new rate, and because their prices are determined by the market, they decide to use the $9,000 per megawatt hour rate on their customers and charge the customers that rate. However, the issues within ERCOT's area seem to be isolated only to them, or at least the severity of the issues in question. Other areas being devastated by the Arctic blast are able to import power from the East Coast. Texas, on the other hand, was only able to import 1,000 megawatts because they are isolated from the rest of the country's power grid. All the while, the coldest temperatures of the event begin to seep into Texas. In northern Texas, near Amarillo, the temperature in the early morning hours of the 15th was negative 11 degrees, with the coldest area in the Texas Panhandle being negative 20 degrees at Palo Duro Reservoir. In NWS Dallas's area of responsibility, temperatures hit 4 degrees at the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, with the high temperature for the 15th being colder than the low temperature. Near Houston, 
Wind chills below zero degrees were observed across the metro on the 15th, with the coldest temperatures occurring in the early morning hours of the 16th. With temperatures this extreme, pipes bursting due to the cold temperatures was common, leaving many who didn't already have power, now without running water. February 16th. At the coldest point of the event, temperatures across Texas were 40 degrees below normal. And yet, another winter storm was about to bring more snow and ice to Texas from the 16th through the 17th. With snow blanketing northern Texas and freezing rain falling onto central parts of the state, areas with the northern band of snow saw snow totals ranging from 1 to 3 inches across the Dallas-Fort Worth area to 5 to 9 inches from a band that formed over I-40 in the Panhandle. The big threat from this new storm was snow and ice, and lots of it. Ice was expected to accumulate on top of the snow, sleet, and ice that was already on the ground. The threat of ice was specifically for areas in eastern Texas to the south of Dallas. Ice expected to be over a quarter of an inch across a vast swath of Texas, with higher amounts observed to the north of the Houston area. With more winter precipitation in the forecast, winter storm warnings were issued yet again across most of Texas and across the country. Abbott declares a reform of ERCOT as an emergency item for the state legislature, and people are still left without power. February 17th During the afternoon and evening hours of the 16th through the 17th, the winter storm produced additional snow and ice across central and southern Texas. With the new round of snow and freezing rain, restoration efforts are stalled as 2.8 million people across Texas are without power. February 18th While most of the winter precipitation in Texas was over, there was one last round in south-central Texas. A heavy snow band brought an additional 1 to 4 inches of snowfall across the San Antonio area, with the most snowfall being recorded near Del Rio, Texas, with 9.7 inches of snowfall being recorded in 24 hours, breaking the 24-hour snowfall record for that area. As temperatures rose and more generation was brought online, ERCOT ended the statewide rolling outages. But as the winter storm moved away from Texas, the threat of additional winter precipitation began to fade, but the biggest issue now was the fallout of the frigid cold. The issue of pipes bursting was an issue seen throughout the state of Texas and across areas that were in the Arctic air mass, but in Texas, this was compounded by water treatment facilities losing power as well. This led to a decreased water pressure and water boil advisories were issued across the state. Nearly 15 million people lost access to clean water and were forced to boil their water before using it. Hard freeze warnings were issued for the 19th and into the 20th, and come the 20th, the majority of winter warnings expire by that night, ending the long week for the state of Texas. But many Texans were left with memories of surviving the deep freeze that they could never forget. And something I remember that I deeply remember about it is, I remember how bad it was talked about. I, they were hyping it up all week. They were talking about how bad this could be. And I was thinking, okay, fine, it's going to be bad. And then I didn't realize until the day it started how bad it was going to be because, well, I mean, with I have a father who works in a nursery, right? A plant nursery. He was home. And then I saw my mom home. And that's when I'm like, oh, okay, this is bad because she works retail. And so unless it's severe, severe, she's at work. And I saw everybody home. I'm like, okay, this is where it gets it's bad, you know, and I, then I kept on hearing about stories of people losing their power and losing their water. That's one thing a lot of people don't know is it was more than just the power outages. There were people even just a city away from me who were losing power and water and all of it at once. My family thankfully never lost power. We did lose water for about 24 hours, which was scary, but Thankfully, we never lost power, and that's never been something that happened. I mean, I remember several times we had having snowstorms before, but I don't ever remember us having where we lost power and water in the whole state or majority of the state. And that was to me was weird. Um. Well, around around the time it was hitting, it it just. It, I, we had power uh, for a brief moment, but, but as as time went on, we went to sleep, you know, just thought it would have power the next uh, day, but, but um, it just shut off, shut off, and 
it was we were miserable we didn't have we we didn't have any resources to really like protect us from the cold our furnace was not working um the best we could do was uh go to real southern round and just like you know fire up the grill and you know just like chill around there but uh luckily my mom owned a uh a pro master a ram pro master it, it was transitioned into a pet salon so she used that to convert uh that power from the generator to the house but even then dog like the only warmth we were able to get was our comforters and a singular yankee candle on the uh on the center of a coffee table but um i as time went on uh we started getting uh cell data back um i was reading the news and there's i i was seeing people like dying within the area elderly people the poor elderly people they they got the worst of it they can't really do much and i remember reading this one uh, she she died in, in her home because it was just so cold and she pretty much froze to death there's no ac I know the entirety of this video has been focused on Texas, but the main reason for that is, relatively speaking, the impacts seen outside of this state were more or less business as usual, with only some of the other states seeing more exceptional effects, at least regarding winter precipitation. The other major states that saw significant impacts that were unusual were Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Oklahoma. Louisiana, specifically near Shreveport, saw snow totals of almost 10 inches with large swaths of Mississippi and Louisiana receiving anywhere from a trace to somewhere between 4 to 10 inches of snow. Most of the Midwest received anywhere from 4 inches of snow all the way up to 14 to 17 inches of snow in portions of Illinois. From the second winter storm, Arkansas received the maximum snowfall total of 15 inches of snow. In Oklahoma, the state saw widespread snow coverage and dangerously cold wind chills, with wind chills being below negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit. But of course, with winterized infrastructure, the main impacts from the systems was the brutal cold behind them, with temperatures being way below zero and wind chills being brutal, from the negative 20s through the negative 50s of the northern and central parts of the country. However, the concern now was recovering from the deep freeze. What followed was the aftermath of the costliest natural disaster in United States history. While Texans initially welcomed the snow, with children playing outside in the snow, the joy quickly died off as soon as the power died. Neighborhood after neighborhood left without power. With the majority of Texas homes being heated through electricity, Texans had to rely on gas heaters or gas stoves or relying on their cars. But of course, in an attempt to keep themselves warm, many would die due to carbon monoxide poisoning. Any store or restaurant nearby was likely closed due to the dangers of contracting frostbite and the lack of power. Pipes were bursting left and right. Images of any exposed form of running water completely frozen over was all over the news. People were left without power and running water all across the state of Texas. As the power outages persisted, people were becoming impatient, going out anyways if they could, but not everyone could. Those who couldn't, and the majority of those who were left to suffer, and the majority of those who perished, were those in low-income communities and in poverty, the elderly, and those with disabilities. Those in poverty had little access to homes and structures as is, and with the deep freeze, those who were homeless were often left out on the streets to fend for themselves in the dangerous cold. Of course, as the situation truly got worse, local charities and churches opened up areas for people to go if they had no access to a place to stay. The elderly, well, not only were they more likely to have pre-existing health conditions, they also generally need extra care, and often are unable to do strenuous activities. Due to this, some of those who lost power who were older sometimes couldn't keep themselves warm, leading to them contracting frostbite and hypothermia, sometimes dying as a result. Those with pre-existing conditions also fit into that category. Many of them often were unable to do tasks that would have been essential to help keep them warm and away from the cold. 
The power crisis still persisted well after the winter storms passed. Through the water boil advisories as water treatment plants were out of power. Water boil advisories lasted in Texas until February 27th. Water and food shortages persisted after the deep freeze, and in terms of the economy, shortages of oil, natural gas, water, livestock, and other goods were reported in Texas. If the deep freeze somehow lasted for even longer, there could have been a potential economic collapse. Across the United States, damages from the winter storms listed by NOAA is $24 billion. But in a report written by the city of Austin and according to the state of Texas, the total damages to the state of Texas overall was $195 billion at the least, with some reports in 2022 suggesting that total could be as high as $300 billion in damages due to property damages to local structures into the power grid, thus making the 2021 Texas Deep Freeze the costliest natural disaster event in United States history. The death toll of the storm system stands at 290 for the first winter storm, including a death from a tornado in the Carolinas, with at least 29 fatalities listed for the second winter storm. However, unofficial death tolls put the death toll in Texas to be anywhere from 426 to 978. However, some areas and communities came together to help those who were in the storm's path to keep warm and support them with food. Cities, such as Austin, reported 50,000 meals distributed in the city by community partners. 120,000 shelf-stable meals distributed by Austin Travis County. And those activities were observed across the state. Some churches opened up as a place to stay for those who had nowhere else to go. Again, it's during the worst of times when the best of humanity is often showcased. Normally, this is where the story would end, but there's some unfinished business regarding ERCOT and other shenanigans that occurred with companies in the state government that I got to go over. Yes, that means we get to talk about... politics. The state of ERCOT. The big talk of the town was the state of ERCOT. As the deep freeze was happening, a few discoveries were found regarding ERCOT. First off was that all of the board members on the ERCOT board didn't live in Texas. They lived elsewhere. One of those members lived in Canada. That's right, one of the people in charge of the power grid that provides power to the majority of the state of Texas didn't even live in the country where Texas is in. They all resigned. In March 2021, the Texas State Legislature introduced a package of bills that would put measures in place to prevent future power outages at extreme temperatures. One bill defined extreme weather conditions to provide guidelines for regulators and industries to design around, and another would create the Texas Supply Chain Security and Mapping Committee to prioritize energy demands during extreme weather. Neither bill passed. It took until June of that year before Governor Abbott signed some kind of bill that addressed the power grid. The bill in question includes new winterization mandates that went into effect in winter 2021 through 2022, with flexible fines that escalate over time. Oversight of the gas system was left to regulators close to the industry. The legislature also passed proposals that allow power plants to store additional fuel on site, or connect the state's power grid to others. However, critics say that it doesn't do enough and that enforcement of the regulations is up to people with close ties to the gas industries. Utility companies overcharging customers and price gouging. Pretty much almost as soon as news about Gritty's exploitation of drastically increasing prices during the winter storm, investigations quickly began on the state level, with universal condemnation from all officials on both sides of the aisle. The company was sued by the state of Texas in March of 2021, and the company declared bankruptcy that same month. However, the state of Texas settled with the company waiving the power bills that were made during the deep freeze. The issue of price increases was observed across the states of Texas and Oklahoma. There were also claims about potential price gouging regarding the gas companies, but the Texas government did not investigate those claims. Other Controversies There were also some smaller stories that made the news in Texas and on the national level that dealt with the winter storms. Some old man traveled to Kanku- wait, that was Ted Cruz. That was a source of controversy that everyone wouldn't shut up about with condemnations on both sides that he said it was a mistake and honestly, I could care less. This is the least interesting thing that came from the deep freeze controversy list. And I seriously cannot believe that this was a bigger issue to some people reporting the crisis than what was actually happening on the ground. And now this is the part where I stop talking about this before my comment section looks like getting DMs from that one really political friend who has no idea what they're talking about. The mayor of Colorado City, Texas got into hot water after saying to residents that were desperate for power and heat that only the strong will survive and the weak will perish. 
basically saying that the government owes the citizens nothing and that it's up to everyone to do something about it, no matter if they could do anything about it or not. He resigned. There was also a big discussion about renewable energy sources being the primary reason as to why people lost power. Renewable energy being the reason why the power grid failed doesn't make sense when multiple different power plants with different energy sources failed. Again, not very interesting, and it just boils down to, say it with me, culture war nonsense that ignores the actual problems and underlying issues of how the Texas deep freeze ended up being the costliest disaster in U.S. history and becoming the deadliest winter storm in recent memory. That covers all the controversies that are big enough for me to mention, so let's wrap this up. The 2021 Valentine's Day Winter Outbreak, commonly referred to as the 2021 Texas Deep Freeze, is an event that is composed of two separate winter storm systems, and one of the coldest Arctic blasts in recent memory. The event itself is one of the most well-known winter storm events in the United States, only rivaled by the 1993 storm of the century, and for good reason. The 2021 Texas Deep Freeze is historic. While many locations affected by the winter storms did see notable impacts such as in Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and in Oklahoma, the scale of the devastation across those states and many others pale in comparison to what happened in Texas. While extreme cold temperatures with wind chills below negative 50 degrees in the northern plains is quite extreme, it's not unheard of, especially over the past few years. The temperatures and winter storms in Texas were historic even from the beginning with one of the largest and deadliest pileups in Texas state history, with over 100 vehicles being involved due to black ice on bridges in Fort Worth, to the numerous records for snowfall, ice accumulation, wind chills, and base temperatures that were broken across the state of Texas. While other portions of the country would look at what happened in Texas from a meteorological level as nothing extreme compared to what other parts of the country get, it's the fact that it happened in Texas of all places, but more importantly, the state was completely unprepared for it. The state, reliant on itself for its own power grid, alongside little oversight and ignoring recommendations to winterize their power grid to make it more resistant to extreme winter events, led to one of the biggest power grid failures observed in the United States. In total, 11 million people in Texas lost power at one point or another due to the event, leading to people going to drastic measures to keep warm, meaning those who did not die from hypothermia and frostbite, likely died of carbon monoxide poisoning. The state's inability to properly regulate its own power grid and inability to learn lessons that should have been learned after the 2011 Groundhog Day blizzard led to the power grid being mere minutes and seconds away from a complete and total failure. On top of that, the extreme cold led to multiple pipes bursting, causing there to be water shortages and numerous water boil advisories across the state. Any running water froze almost immediately with the insane temperatures lots of ice down power lines and trees, and a general lack of awareness of what to do from some residents led the Texas Deep Freeze to be one of the most horrific disasters seen in winter weather history. Companies chose greed, price gouging electricity bills to those in Texas, and gradually they came to some justice, some companies more than others. While some steps were taken to hopefully prevent what happened a few years ago from happening again, as evident from the recent winter storm just about a week ago at the time of recording, those efforts have come up short. The pain that those in Texas felt during this storm system shouldn't be forgotten, and researching this storm left me feeling the same way when I researched Katrina. The situation was far worse than it was made out to be. It wasn't given the attention it got until Texas's power grid nearly completely collapsed. Some people wouldn't believe what the models were doing, and the systems that Texans relied on failed. And while people were suffering, some politicians were focused on culture war nonsense and telling people to grow up and fend for themselves. Thankfully, that wasn't all of them. Multiple cities and churches opened up locations where people who had no place to stay could stay during the event, and many communities prepared food and the like to feed to those without power. There was some good that came out of this. However, the point still stands that more needs to be done to help prevent this from happening again. The 2021 Texas Deep Freeze is an event that meteorologists won't forget, one that Texans won't forget, and one that I will not forget anytime soon. Just so you're aware, this was a pain to write. Maybe it was just my luck, but finding resources regarding forecasts and a synopsis for this event was hard to find initially due to the fact that I was researching this while another winter storm was ongoing in Texas. But I just nearly had no resources regarding a full snowfall map. 
I say nearly because I did find one. Shoutouts to those on the Tornado Talk Discord server for being a lifesaver and helping me connect with resources that I could use for in-depth analysis. Video schedule is changing slightly. I'm going for Maria Nax and the March 25th, 2021 tornado outbreak is being switched with the 2012 derecho. Special thanks to my proofreaders, those being Alice, Broker, Edgy Potato, Rishi, and Thomas Schwent. Sounds are quite for the character stills I use, Hufflepuff224 and Helix for the interviews, and everyone for watching. I will get around to posting the interviews on the Patreon and here for YouTube members when I get the chance. Speaking of memberships and the Patreon, special thanks to those subscribed to the channel Patreon or are a YouTube member. Those being Ace Cooper, Maxwell Looney, Montpellier, Tadeus Weather Space Station, Tanner Looper, and That Dude at the Ulfies Army Tier, and Vasilius of Stupidonia, Jay Cario, King Shisha, Neon Binary Origin, Talkboy, and Worm Off the String at the Ulf Mini Tier. If you want to have access to full uncut interviews and my scripts alongside other things in the future, consider subscribing to the Patreon or becoming a member. It helps me financially and will allow me to do in-person interviews in the future, hopefully. That being said, I'm Alfaria. Thank you so much for watching. If you like what I do, consider liking, subscribing, commenting your thoughts, sharing it around, all that jazz. You all stay safe out there, and I'll see you all soon.